Hello, this uh, video is to talk about the relationship between racial economic inequality and healthcare disparity. Uh, first of all, I hear a couple of kinds of comments that I think are reasoning errors when it comes to race and inequality in any area. The, the most significant one and the most serious one is the belief that if it's happening to other people, such as poor whites, then it can't be a race problem. And that's just not true. Uh, the, the, what makes it a race problem is the gap between what happens in the different groups. Okay. The other uh, problem that people have, especially when in my, uh, with my research is I focus on African Americans. And I hear people say, well, it's not just just and the emph emphasis is on just happening to African Americans. And that's a true statement. It doesn't at all change or discount what is happening to African Americans. I focus on African Americans for several reasons. Number one, I believe that history is important to why we have inequalities. And people have very different histories. And it's important to understand those hip histories and not combine everybody in one group. For instance, Japanese Americans uh, have been here many centuries, but when they came, the initial groups came over, they were all well educated and task uh, and people with professions. And that was largely because the emperor of Japan wanted wanted to be sure that the the um, the image that J Japanese put forth would reflect well back on Japan. So Japan in the 17th and 18th century would not allow poor people to immigrate. Only people with skills could immigrate. Okay, so. What we had coming to America were a lot of Japanese who had, were educated and a lot were farmers. And it's not to say the Japanese didn't, didn't and don't. They continue to experience discrimination. But uh, it, if you compare Japanese American to African Americans who were legally kept uneducated until the 20th century and even then received really bad quality education until the middle of uh, the twin middle of the 20th century you're comparing apples and oranges as minority groups the other thing for in the other thing to know about Japanese is Japanese uh, had a large part of their wealth taken away from them during World War II they were, uh, as a group, fairly wealthy farmers in California. And I won't get into all of this because um, I want you to take, if you can, take my racism course, or if you had another school, take the racism course. But my point is that groups have a racialized history that impacts where they are and to put every group in and to group all groups together uh uh then all the groups suffer i think for instance appalachian whites suffer from being in the white group as opposed to an ethnic white minority uh they have uh some of the worst health statistics and economic inequalities uh but they don't get broken out so I am a proponent of breaking out groups and, and talking groups individually. Doing that in no way implies that I'm doing a hierarchy of pain. In fact, when I give my talks uh, nationally, I start off by saying I'm not doing a hierarchy of pain. I'm not trying to say who is the worst off in America, who has the most pain in America. That's an irrelevant discussion. I'm just trying to give you uh, an overview of inequality 
um, based on race. It's not to say that whites don't and aren't suffering and that some whites may be suffering even more than some blacks, but there is a racial component that is centered around uh, uh, whites be having a better status. So the worldview that you have to start is racism impacts everything in America. And you may have seen this before, but I'm going to go over it again. This is my slide of how everything is impacted, how health is impacted by everything and how racism impacts everything. So what we have is African-Americans who come to this country as slaves and then suffer through legal apartheid and then continue to suffer through racism. Those that provides both a historical and a current deprivation and oppression. And what that means is we have embedded social and racial inequalities in all our systems. And you can't, if you, you can't separate out one system and say, well, in this system, we have racial inequalities, but in these other systems, we don't. We have racial inequalities in uh, all the systems. I wanna, I'll want to. i come back to that in a minute. But what I want to show is those inequalities impacts what is available for communities and what is available for individuals. So when you focus on individual behavior and choices, and no doubt that's an important point, that always when you're talking about population health versus individual health, so if you were talking to me, I'm overweight, and if you were talking to me, you certainly would want to counsel me about exercising and the food choices I made. But if you're talking about changing the population's health, then you've got to look at the environments in which they live and change those environments. And all of that chronic stress of racism, all of that affects health. Going back to what I, the point that I want to make here is the embedded racial inequality. There are wealth and income inequalities, and I'm going to go in great detail on that in a minute. That, there's educational inequality. We're not, there has been a significant growth from out of slavery to now in the percentage and number of people, because uh, who are educated. You're talking about uh, less than one digit coming out of slavery to over 85% now who graduate from high school. So there's been a significant growth, but there's disparities. So even into the profession, so what you see, for instance, law school is a good example. Law schools admit whites at a much higher rate than their representation in the LSAT pool. So I'm not even talking about in the population pool. I'm talking about in the pool of people who want to go to law school and take the LSAT, whites are uh, have a uh, are, have an advantage in that admission process. In criminal justice system, when you uh, control for severity of crime, uh, you get blacks w with longer sentence. In fact, one study showed that the more black you looked, the longer your sentence was. And that was true as if in fact you were white, the more black looking white people got longer sentences than the more white looking white people. When we're talking about environment, studies have shown that the number one factor to predict where a toxic dump will be placed is the race of the community and then the income. That is a toxic dump is more likely to be placed in a place closer to a black middle-class community than it is to a poor white community. Now, I'm not saying that toxic dumps aren't placed in these communities. Remember, we're talking about disparities. We're not talking about all or nothing. Uh, housing, 
over and over again, uh, we continue to see that housing discrimination and housing loan, one of the reasons that this uh, the housing bubbles burst impacted the black community so significantly is because the whole predator lending practices were tried out on the black community before they were imported into the white community. For years, uh, for instance, here in Dayton, Ohio, about 10, 12 years ago, the city of Dayton, which is half black, tried to or pass an ordinance that would restrict the predatory lending practices of banks in housing because it was such a bad problem and mostly affecting black people. And they passed an ordinance, but the state of Ohio uh, overturned it because they saw it as a unique problem to the black community and they didn't want to burden the housing industry with it. The tar TGAD uh, means uh, targeting of gun, alcohol, and drugs. And if you read my to to tobacco article, in um in in uh in my dying wild black book you will see that there is significant targeting of the community that it's not people are just not being treated equally that People are going after selling drugs, going after marketing guns. One of the things that we tried to do in the 1980s, which was unsuccessful, is to get rid of what was called the Saturday Night Special. It was a very cheap gun who's small, and the only design for it was uh, shooting people. And and it uh, and and we tried to outlaw it as a, a, on a strict liability claim. We lost employment. Uh, I'm going to show you where blacks have more unemployment. And right now, what is happening to the black middle class is that there's go a growing discrepancy among black the hiring of black professionals. And finally, food, water, and et cetera. It, uh, the issue of food deserts uh, is a significant issue. And it's be, it, if you are a black middle-class community, you more likely live in a food desert than a uh, white middle-class community, maybe even more than a poor white community. So the point here is you can never say race is not a factor. Just because you move race as a factor in all of these dimension, dimension, the racial inequalities that are built in, that are built into our society and the law doesn't deal with, and we'll talk about more, that then impacts health and and impacts uh, the quality of health. Now, one of, one of the things I wanted to talk about is the impact of uh, economic uh, inequality on health care, okay? Uh, so we like to believe that the color of money is green and if you have enough green that will take you out of that will take you out of racial inequalities. But the fact is is racial wealth and income, gaps are significant and growing. First, I want to go deal with racial income inequality. So what we see here is a distribution of income by race, uh, white, black, and Hispanic origin for 2010. And what you see is in significant disparities. Whites, about twice as many whites make over $100,000 a year as blacks. And about 60%, almost 70% of Blacks make less than $50,000 a year, while only about 45% of Whites make less than $50,000 a year. So that income, that's an income impact, that distribution, a racial distribution of income that is going to have an impact. 
Here's another way to see median incomes, uh, racial gaps between 1989 and 2010. And this, is, if anybody's interested, this is a neat little chart you can go to and you can pull up different years, excuse me, years. But what you see is that there's always been a gap. In, 19, in 1989, there was a $27,000 gap between non-whites and whites and in 2010 there's about an eighteen thousand dollar gap so there's been a, a closing of the gap but the gap still exists and the gap is more is is significant one of the reason for this growing gap is the jobless rate uh the african-american jobless rate has been growing significantly it's at 14.4% compared to 7.4% of whites. Now, one thing, this was this is recent statistics. This doesn't even show the difference between young adults. The young uh, black young adults have almost a 34% unemployment rate compared to a 10% unemployment rate for white young, young adults. So this, this is a surging uh, joblessness rate. And in some parts, you know, you have to ask yourself, is the recovery in the right white community occurring because of discrimination towards blacks? Another Again, aspect to show the gap to in the median the income median value uh, between financial whites and assets. blacks. And wow. this is a wealth gap. It is true that white really incomes have this. been decreasing over the years, but so has blacks and maybe and at a larger portion. The gap now between whites and blacks is six thousand dollars compared to the low of four thousand eight hundred. Uh, in the early 2000s. The racial wealth inequality. So, uh, the as I said in the other slide, the wealth gap between blacks and whites has tripled since 1984. Okay, Whites had a $90,000, in 1984, $90,000 wealth. Uh, and blacks had uh, around $6,000, and now whites have $265,000 um, in wealth, in blacks' uh, median wealth. That's half of the people, half of the white people have wealth over $265,000, while half of the black people have wealth of less than $28,000. So when you look at the wealth gap, which is even more significant than the income gap, you see that uh, in 1989, there was a $23,000 gap in wealth between whites and non-whites, and that that gap has actually grown over the last uh, 20 years. Now the gap is $20,000. $1,000, right? No, 31000 excuse me. Now the gap is $31,000. So that's a huge financial asset because how you get in trouble is uh, with uh, you, you medical bankruptcy, uh, educating your children, all come out of assets. No one can pay for that just on the income they make. Finally, the white wealth growth um, goes to the, how fast uh, uh, the wealth has grown. So uh, for every dollar in income increase yields $5 worth of wealth for whites, while it only yields 69 cents worth of wealth for black. Even when you control for the same amount of wealth to start off with, that is, blacks and whites have the same amount of wealth, the growth is different. For every dollar in income increase when blacks have similar wealth to start, whites have a wealth growth of $5.19, while blacks have a 
wealth in groups of four dollars and three cents. So what all does all this have to do with health care disparities? Clearly, economic barriers to health care include the uninsured or the underinsured, which is over forty five million dollars of every forty five million uninsured and underinsured. But blacks are disproportionately represented because they have a disproportionate percentage of unemployed. They have a dis of the people who are employed. They're more working class in uh, jobs that have little or no insurance, and they have more disqualification for government programs. So economic barriers affect everyone. But we have a saying in the black community, and I think these statistics bears it out. When white people get a cold, black people get pneumonia. That is to say that because things are not because the things are not equal in this country, there is not an equal impact. And if you want to make changes, you have you and you design programs, you can't just design programs thinking that they're going to have the same impact on each of the community. Um, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to post them on Moodle.